Okay, so we're coming into the develop module and we're going to develop this particular image. Um, so the develop module in Lightroom is the same as Camera Raw. Okay, we talked about that. It's Camera Raw in different clothing. So it has the same tools, the same functionality. It's going to be able to be read by Bridge as well as Lightroom. So if you actually correct something in Bridge and bring it into Lightroom, as long as you bring it with that XMP file, Lightroom will be able to read that XMP file. Same thing the other way. All right, so if we just take a look at the quick setup, we have the navigator over here. This is useful if you, for some reason, zoom in on the image. You can then, you know, navigate through and find different spaces within the image. We also have the Lightroom presets as well as your own user-made presets. We'll go over that in a second. Snapshot. Snapshot allows you to save a development setting. All right, we'll go over that in a second as well. Snapshot, in my opinion, is super cool. We also have the history. This shows all the steps that you've done and then collections. If you uh, have any particular collection that you've developed, it'll show up here. On the other side, we have the histogram. If you notice, as I hover over the histogram, different information shows up, blacks, shadows, exposure, as well as highlights and whites. It also shows you the information as far as ISO, shutter speed, all that good stuff. Here you have some crop tools, spot cleaning tools, as well as red eye and some different filters and such. And then below that you have all of your basic development tools, um, including tonal curve, split toning, and the other such things. We'll talk about those in a minute. So first thing to do, take a look at your image. What's going on in your image? This particular image, just like most raw images, is slightly flat. If we look at the histogram, there is no true black point and no true white point. So if you're a visual person like me, you can click on the histogram and actually drag it until you get a black or a white point, which I think is super cool that you can do this. And then you will also notice down here, the exposure has been adjusted. So if you prefer clicking on the histogram, you're good. If you don't and you like to adjust the adjustment slider for exposure, you can do that down there. So that's the first thing to take a look at. Second thing you can take a look at, which is really useful, raw files, guys, let you adjust white balance after the fact. Okay, so if you shot for some reason in either auto white balance or you shot in the wrong white balance, you can adjust that after the fact right here. You can choose any of these presets. I'm just going to click through a couple of them. And you can see how that's changing the image. And it's also changing the number here that is referencing Kelvin temperature. So 55 degrees Kelvin is our daylight standard. It looks a little bit cool. You can pop back to as shot to see what it was. It was at 59, a little bit warmer. Not necessarily. It's just basically changing the overall tonal color of the picture. So if you pop down a tungsten, everything's going to look blue because um, it's assuming you shot it in a tungsten lighting situation and compensating for that. So it's not going to take away from the clarity of the picture in any way. It's just going to be something that um, either is a correction point or if you want to add creatively, um, you know, maybe warm up your image a little bit so it looks a little bit warmer or cool it down so it looks cooler. That is a creative choice of yours. I'm going to stick with as shot because I like it the way it is. So from here, I can adjust exposure more if I want to. If I want to, you know, make my shadows a little bit darker, I can use this shadow slider to bring down my shadows. I can also, you know, up my whites a little bit if I want to make my whites a little bit brighter. Notice the histogram moves as you move these things. I can also add a little bit of contrast. And I usually like to add a little bit of clarity to an image. It just kind of sharpens it up just a tad. Um, this is a little bit much. So I'm going to bring those blacks in a little bit more. All right, so once we have those basic settings done, all right, this is where the snapshot thing comes in, all right, and this is where I think this is really cool. I can hit this, this plus button next to the snapshot. I hit the snapshot plus button, and it will take a snapshot of that development as it is. So you can save multiple versions of development within the image. So I'm going to call this basic, and it's going to pop up over here. Now I can continue with my development. So say I want to make this image black and white. I can come in here, hit the black and white button, play around with my black and white tonal sliders down here to get more contrast or what have you um, from there. I can now take a snapshot of this and call it black and white. 
Between these two snapshots, I can jump back and forth. So I have my black and white snapshot. I have my basic snapshot. I can look at either one. This is huge because you are not saving multiple versions of a file. You are saving that one file with multiple developments. And all of that it is doing is creating in the XMP information the recipe for these multiple developments. So I'm going to pop back to my basics and kind of show you guys a couple of the other things that can be done here. If you're comfortable with the tonal curve and you want to play with that, um, it gives you the option for a tonal curve. But I'm going to play with some other things. We have the ability here for hue and saturation. So we can adjust hue, saturation, and luminance of each color. So if I want to make the ocean pop out a little bit more, I'm going to pull up the saturation under that aqua color and push it up a little bit. It's working a little bit. I'm going to try the blue and going to try the green. So now I can see my ocean is a little bit greener. If I can't see it very well, I can always do the split screen before and after. So here's my image before. Here it is after. If I click on this a couple times, I'll get a couple different previews here. Here's my before. Here's my after. And there's the split screen. If you don't like this, you can click back here and it'll disappear. But sometimes that helps to see, like, okay, where, where am I in this process? What have I done? Does it look good or is it too much? So I pushed this up a little bit. Um, say I want to change the color of this a little bit. I can come in here into my hue. I'm going to pick the orange because that's probably pretty close. And as I slide this, notice the hue is changing for all of those particular colors in that range. I think that looks like crap, so I'm going to put it back to zero. Hit enter. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm leave it alone. So I may want to take another snapshot. Call it something descriptive so you know what it is. So from here, if I want to get a little bit crazy, I have the ability to do split toning. So split toning is where your fun, like, Instagrammy looks come in. Um, if we take a look at the split toning tool, you have the ability to um, split tone between highlights and shadows. So I am going to push the saturation up on my highlights to about 50%. And as I slide this through, you'll notice all my highlights are changing colors based on this little color bar. So let's make my highlights blue. And if I do about the same, and you can adjust it as you see fit. For shadows, I can change those colors to have a split tone effect. And then I can adjust my balance between what is considered a highlight and what is considered a shadow. Again, take a snapshot. Detail, guys, is going to be where you can sharpen. All right. Now, sharpening is one of those things that for me is, um, I like to do sharpening last. I like to do it right before I print. But if for some reason you're going to be sending these just as digital files to a client or you're going to be posting them to web, sharpening in here is not a bad idea. Um, you guys can play with that as you see fit. There's also some noise reductions. They work decently. Um, don't depend on noise reduction to save your butt if your image is super duper noisy, like you took it at 3200 in pitch black. Um, so you're going to get digital noise from that. It will help reduce it some, but it's not going to get rid of it. Hmm? Yes, it does take away the clarity in the image. All right, lens correction. Um, one of the things I usually recommend you guys do is remove chromogenic abrasions. Chromogenic abrasions are when you have an image that has an extreme highlight and extreme shadow right next to each other. So imagine taking a picture looking up through trees and you see the trees are, are backlit by the sun. Okay? What happens is if this is your tree branch, all right, on either side of said tree branch, you will see a, like a red line and then on the other side like a green line. How many of you guys have seen something like that happen in your images? I'm getting a, oh, you're, okay, so you have seen that. Um, Sometimes you'll see the red and you won't see the green, um, but it looks like a little halo almost around the edge of the image or the edge of the, the tree branches or whatever. 
I'll see if I can find one to show you guys later. Basically, what that is is a lens issue. Okay, so I, I know I have the, huh? No, filter won't necessarily fix it. It has something to do with optics in the lens. <laughs> So the putting a filter over the lens is probably not going to fix it. It has something to do with the way the, the optics come in the lens. I have a 24 to 105, the same lens we have in the cage, and I know that I have issues with that particular lens on occasion with chromogenic abrasions. And so it's when you, like I said, it's you'll see it when you have an extreme highlight next to an extreme shadow. It will be on the edge of that line. It looks like, you know, if you have white and black, it looks like you almost have, like, red along the line or, or green. You see what I'm talking about now? Exactly. This is the best way to get rid of that. All right? Remove chromogenic abrasions is the best way to get rid of that. I do not know of a way in Photoshop short of some big time work that will get rid of that and it's going to take you time. This does it really quickly. Mm, not so much. It has more to do with just the lens. And so that right there is really great for um, fixing that. So even if you guys don't see it in your picture, and I'm not seeing it anywhere in this particular image, um, only place I might see it might be along here, and I'm not seeing it. But that's a good thing to add to pretty much every, every development process, is just making sure you're clicking that. All right. Continuing on effects. Um, so if I zoom out, vignetting, come on, zoom out for me. There we go. Post crop vignetting. Um, if you guys notice, take a look down here in the corner of this image. The sand is kind of a little bit darker and over here is a little bit darker as well. You guys see that? What that is is because as, as the light comes in the camera lens, it falls off the edges of the image, okay? So the image of the, the edges of the image look darker. So you can adjust this here to either lighten up, that's extreme obviously, lighten up those to match. So that looks pretty good right there. Or if you want to get creative, you can give your image a vignette by darkening those corners, okay? Now you want to make sure um, this post crop vignette is set to post crop because if you crop the image, it will then adjust that vignette to the new crop of the image. Um, you can change the midpoint, how close in or far out it is. You can also adjust how round or square it is. So rounder is going to look more realistic. Feather is going to be how soft it is on the edge. So I mean, if you want something that looks like that, you can do that. So you have a white circular image. Or if you want something that looks like that, you can do that as well. If you want to look like you're, you know, peering through a spyglass, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's kind of weird. Um, so if I put that back to zero, I push up feather. And then, I'll, okay, that's a little extreme, guys. But I get your point. What you mean? I'm going to push it out. It's a personal preference thing, and that's what I was going to say. Is for me, it's too much. I don't like it. It's too much. For you guys, it may be your look. It may be what you like. So, you know, you may want that heavy, dark, you know, vignette going on. Um, me, I usually try to do pretty minimal processing. I try to keep it pretty simple. Um, but some people may like that. So that's where, you know, you can play. You can play with that in there if you want to add a little bit of a vignette or if you just want to correct lens fall off. You're going to see lens fall off quite a bit on wide angle lenses. So if you're using the 17 millimeter tilt shift lens or the 10 millimeter or the fisheye, you're really going to see that around the edge of the image. So you may want to correct it right there. Grain, this is where if you feel like you know you want to be kind of uh, old school, you can add film grain look to the image. Um, Photoshop also has filters for this. So I'm going to just do this a little bit. If I'm not mistaken, this was taken at ISO 400. I can already see a little bit of uh, noise coming in. But if I put grain on there, I can adjust the size of the grain. I can adjust the roughness of the grain. Um, so I can make it look something similar to film. So for you peeps who like that photojournalistic look, all right, photojournalism from back in the day when they actually used film, um, they usually used high-speed films, and they had to do what's called push development. So it got a really grainy look. So you might like a nice rough grain look to your image um, if you are feeling that that old school. Let's see, zoom in there. 
old school grain look from the days of days gone by of uh, PJ. Not for me, so I'm going to kill it and take it off. All right, camera calibration, not going to worry too much about that. Um, you can, you know, calibrate your camera to um, have specific settings in there so that you're just dealing with your own specific camera. Like I said, not going to worry too much about that. I think there are things you can download for that. Thank you. So I'm going to save this as my, my split tone. I'm just going to save that again. And then the last thing I wanted to show you guys real quickly while we're in here is the presets. So if we take a look, Lightroom has a bunch of presets. Let me go back to my basic development so you guys get a better idea of what they look like by themselves. Lightroom has a bunch of presets, so you can click through and choose these presets. Those are some black and white presets. Um, go back to basic again. Old school color pre presets, so there's like your aged photo look. Um, cross-processed look and again you can go into any of these development settings over here and it, tweak them and adjust them as you see fit or if for some reason I'm gonna go back to my basic snapshot again um, if for some reason you like something you've done on your own so I like my my split Tony look here okay I can save this as a preset and I can do that by clicking up here on the plus button it will say user preset at the top or untitled preset. Make sure all of these are clicked, um, the ones pretty much that are already clicked because those are the things that you've changed, okay? So those are the things you've done in the preset that you've changed and I'm gonna call this something descriptive. And hit create and it's gonna show up down there under my user presets. So now if I want to go to another image and apply that same look, I just click that preset and it's done. Wait, can you do that again? <laughs> yes, I will do that again. So whatever I've done to this image, if I like it, all right, if I like it and I want to be able to apply it to multiple images, I can save it as a preset. And I do that by clicking up here and this dialog box will come up. Save it as something descriptive so you know what it is. Don't call it like diamonds preset. Call it like split tone, blue pink, or something that describes what that is going to do to the image. So and then like I said, if I like it, I can come to another image. It's going to show up under user presets. I just click it and it's going to apply all those settings. So this is one way if you want, if you have a lot of images that have same setting so for instance if we look at these images my panoramic images most of these except for that one because I've done some stuff to it but most of these are pretty similar images so what I can do is develop one of them just go really quickly through I'm gonna go back into develop I'm gonna develop this quickly by giving it a little bit of an exposure boost let's go back to the top so I have all my basic development tools give a little bit of an exposure boost going to bring the shadows down, keep some contrast in those rocks, and give it some clarity. Now if I want, I can save just that as basic development. Create, and then I should be able to apply it to all of those images. so that I don't necessarily have to do it every single time. You can also, if you want to use this basic development every time in the future, you can apply the basic development preset that you create to every image upon ingestion. So that's kind of a cool thing you can do too. Go ahead, Diamond, what was your question? So we're doing keyboard, star, and editing. All right, any questions about development? Okay, then let me stop my recording.